Yep, that's John Belushi playing drums at CBGB with the Dead Boys. You're probably wondering how we got here. Well, it all started back around 1977. Rolling Stone magazine's Charles M. Young hung out with John Belushi for more than a year before publishing his piece, John, Son of Samurai. In researching the piece, Young became friends with Belushi. One March weekend in 1978, the writer brought the comic with him to CBGB to check out the Dead Boys. When Belushi peeked his head into the CBGB dressing room to introduce himself, Hi, I'm John Belushi. Cheetah Chrome immediately recognized him from Saturday Night Live. We all hit it off with him right away, recalls a guitarist. So when Belushi heard about a series of benefit concerts being held at CBGB for Dead Boys drummer Johnny Blitz, the comedian jumped at the opportunity to help out by taking Blitz's throne behind the Dead Boys for one night. Hi everybody, Brendan here with another edition of This Month in Punk Rock History. It's May 2023 and this month we take a look at the Johnny Blitz benefit event held at CBGB on May 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. 1978, and it featured more than 30 acts from the New York scene. But first, I want to take a minute to offer a quick shout out to my host, Sweet Jimmy Network. Check out previous editions of This Month in Punk Rock History, 60 Second Reviews, and coming soon, a new series called Sounds Unknown, which will showcase local and underground bands from all over. Also, stick around for Dr. Doom, a cinematic tragedy coming soon. Now, let's get into it. Johnny Blitz and Cheetah Chrome previously played together in Cleveland proto-punk group Rocket from the Tombs. When Rocket fell apart, bassist David Thomas and guitarist Peter Loeffner leaned into the new wave and post-punk, while Blitz and Chrome teamed up with Stiv Baders, formerly of Cleveland rock band Mother Goose. Along with friends Jeff Magnum and Jimmy Zero, they formed Frankenstein, which broke up and later reformed as The Dead Boys. With the encouragement of Joey Ramone, they moved to New York and auditioned for a slot at Hilly Crystal's CBGB. Don't tell me, there's something there. There is definitely something there. They not only earned that slot, but also acquired Crystal as a manager. The Dead Boys became the de facto house band at CBGB and quickly integrated themselves into the New York scene. One night, Dead Boys drummer Johnny Blitz and his girlfriend Danielle were hanging out with blondie roadie Michael Sticka and photographer slash stylist Marshall Leon. They emerged from CBGB after a long night of partying and stumbled over to the Deli Stop, a frequent Dead Boys haunt at 2nd Ave and 5th Street. When it was finally time to call it a night, Sticka and Leon went to hail a cab while Blitz and Danielle finished their meals. Suddenly, a car swerves, almost hitting Sticka and Leon. Leon shouted at the car. As Sticka remembers it, the car stopped and no less than five men exit and approach the punks. Sticka pushed Leon out of the way, but she was intercepted by a woman who jumped out of the car, and then those two started go at it. Meanwhile, Sticka, surrounded by guys with baseball bats and chains, pulls a switchblade and takes a nice swipe at one of the men, opening his chest. Barely phased, the man continued to attack Sticka. Leon managed to get away from her assailant and ran into the deli for backup. Her cries for help were enough of a distraction for Sticka to evade his attackers, but Blitz didn't catch on to that and chased them down. The next thing I know, says Blitz, I'm walking into a baseball bat. So, out comes my knife. Sticka tried to call off his friend, but to no avail. Two of the mob hung back, waiting to net the pump. The roadie ran after, and by the time he caught up to his friend, Blitz was on the ground, bloody, opened, as Sticka describes. Sticka assumed his friend was dead, so he caught up to the attacker and stabbed the man several times in the back. The scene was quickly besieged by flashing lights and sirens. Sticka and the girls managed to escape via taxi to Leon's place, where Sticka called Dead Boys road manager James Sliman, saying, They fucking killed Johnny! They fucking killed Blitz! Sliman called Haley Crystal, who called the hospital. Blitz's friends went to St. Vincent's to check on him, only to find out he was undergoing surgery and that he may not recover. Meanwhile, Sticka goes to the 9th Precinct to offer his version of events, and he was arrested for stabbing Blitz. After clarifying Blitz's role, Sticker was booked for stabbing the first guy and sent to Rikers Island the next day. According to Sliman, it was Crystal's idea to host a benefit event. Dead Boys guitarist Cheetah Chrome and girlfriend Guida Gash quickly assembled the who's who of the New York scene. From behind bars, Sticka convinced Blondie to join the event, despite Debbie Harry's reluctance. Sticka was under the impression that half of the proceeds would go to help bail him out. It didn't. More on that later. Finally, the main event. Details about each night are a bit sketchy, but I'll do my best. A promotional video says over 30 bands and performers participated. Newspaper ads only listed 27 performances and with a few repeats. 
The Arturo Vega Design t-shirt sold as part of fundraising efforts listed 31 names, some of which were there not as acts in and of themselves, but as support for the other bands. Thursday, May 4th. The Contortions, Corpse Grinders, Erasers, Ramones, Sick Fox, Spicy Bits, Stilettos. Let's break it down. The Contortions were a no-wave band formed by former Teenage Jesus and the Jerk saxophonist James Chance. Author Simon Reynolds describes the Contortions as jazz-scarred thrash funk, whose shows often ended with frontman-provoked fistfights, though none were reported on this particular night. Corpse Grinders was ex Bratz guitarist Rick Rivets and New York Dolls bassist Arthur Killer Kane. Named after a horror B movie and sporting pale makeup, pseudo fascist costumes, and schlocky theatrics, Corpse Grinders have a solid claim to pioneering horror punk. They only ever put out one album and one single and never really made any waves outside of Greenwich Village before breaking up. The Erasers were a Terry Orc band, which means they come to punk rock from the artsy fartsy angle of things. Think of television only more raw and with three women and Walter Lohr's little brother Richie. They also never gained any traction outside the city. Of course, the standout act of the night was the Ramones. You may have heard of them. When asked for his thoughts on performing that night, Joey Ramone told Bomp Magazine, I thought it was great. I wanted to do it. It was a good cause, it worked out good, and everyone turned out, so that was kind of nice. This was their first CBGB show since October of 77, and it was Tommy Ramone's last show. A year later, they would play the club for the last time. Once declared by John Belushi to have the best asses in New York City, the Seek Fucks were a goofy, glam, schlock punk group fronted by Russell Walensky and featuring Tish and Snooky Belomo of Manic Panic fame. Spicy Bits were another footnote band featuring a bunch of people who would go on to form other bands no one ever heard of outside the Bowery. They couldn't even get top billing in a porn film. Guitarist Allison East also played with the Dots, who played the final night of the event. Now, the newspaper ad says Stiletto, but I'm pretty sure it's The Stilettos. And if I'm wrong about this, feel free to correct me in the comments section. So, assuming it is The Stilettos, this is the band that once had Billy O'Connor, Chris Stein, Debbie Harry, and Fred Smith, collectively also known as Blondie. They were later featured in a porno movie called Punk Rock. The version of the group that played that night likely included dead boy Cheetah Chrome and New York doll Walter Lohr. Okay, who are you? I'm just a friend of a friend. A cop! Friday, May 5th. Criminals, Dictators, Flesh Tones, Mumps, Slender Band, Stumble Bunny, Student Teachers. The Criminals, also known as Sylvain Sylvain and The Criminals. When Jerry and Johnny left the New York Dolls, they found success with the Heartbreakers. The rest of the Dolls kind of languished in the short term. The Criminals was one of a string of Sylvain bands, including the Teardrops, the 14th Street Band, and much later, Batusis with Cheetah Crow. The Dictators were last seen on the wrong end of the Benefit concert when handsome Dick Manitoba got his ass handed to him by Jane County after a night of drunken heckling turned into an onstage brawl and a Benefit was held to help County pay for legal bills. For more on that, dig through this month in Punk Rock History archives. That altercation led to the band's effective blackballing, but according to guitarist Scott Top 10 Kempner, a defiant Hilly Crystal gave them a home and, he says, we broke the house attendance record. The Flesh Tones are one of those bands you never actually heard, but all your favorite bands love them. New York Dolls manager Marty Thau describes them as a combination of rebellious rhythm and blues, surf and rockabilly music, complemented by an irresistible take on 70s punk energy. They made their debut at CBGB in 76 and were the first band booked at the 930 Club in DC. They were also among the first of the scene to have their own true music video. The Mumps were another band's band, fronted by the first ever gay reality TV star, Lance Loud. The Mumps have been praised by R.E.M., Jane County, Paul Rubens, and many, many more. Keyboardist and chief songwriter Christian Hoffman says the band defied genre definitions and describes their playing style as inconsistent. We weren't powerful enough on our own to make that leap from small clubs to an actual career, Hoffman told Bay Area Reporter. The Slender Band could have been the next Blondie, playing a sort of pop-punk at CBGB non-stop between 77 and 78. A New York Times review once called them terse, punchy, and disciplined. The decision not to sign with Marty Thau's Red Star label caused an irreparable rift among band members and that led to their breakup. 
Stumble Bunny was another group formed from the fallout of the New York Dolls implosion. Chris Robinson played keyboards on the Dolls Japan tour but left shortly after the tour's conclusion. When Johansson went solo, the band folded and Robinson was joined by Dolls substitute bassist Peter Jordan to form Stumble Bunny. The student teacher's female rhythm section, comprised of Lori Reese on bass and Laura Davis on drums, inspired Beastie Boys' Kate Schellenbach to take up drum. More on that in the archives, too. The student teachers were invited to Max's Kansas City for their first proper gig by friends The Blessed, who were absent from the benefit due to a band they endured following a small fire at CBGB. With a bassist called Howie Pyro, what more could one expect? Saturday, May 6th. Helen Wheels, Corpse Grinders, Criminals, Dead Boys, Ghosts, Shrapnel. We already talked about Corpse Grinders and the Criminals, both featuring former New York Dolls. If you need a refresher, skip back a minute. Born Helen Robbins, Helen Wheels first hit the music scene as a supporter of the band that would become Blue Oyster Cult. Of all the women largely written out of the punk scene, Helen was the punkest of the punks. A bodybuilder who is friendly with Hell's Angels, she is often described as quiet and sweet when off stage. Ghosts might win the prize for the most obscure. I had to dig deep on this one. And if my research is correct, this power pop trio was led by a guy called Excessive, who wrote the song Richard is a Forkhead in reference to Richard Hell's hair. That's about all I got. Again, if you know more, fill me in below. Shrapnel. Hailing from Red Bank, New Jersey, they were once called the Brat Patrol by Punk Magazine. The group adopted a militaristic aesthetic, sporting fatigues and helmets, and they once made an appearance in Spider-Man comics. The Dead Boys closed out the night with ex-New York Dolls drummer Jerry Nolan filling in on the skins. And in case you're keeping track, that's six ex-Dolls so far. John Belushi gave Nolan a break, taking over drum duties for Sonic Reducer and Little Girl, which also featured half of the power pop duo Paley Brothers, Jonathan Paley. Sunday, May 7th. Dead Boys, Dots, Rudy's, Sender, Steel Tips, Suicide. Unadvertised was Blondie. The Dots from New York City were more popular in West Germany, but frontman Jimmy Quid found greater success as a producer for Bad Brains. Also, remember Allison from Spicy Bits? This was her other band. The Rudys had been friends with the Dead Boys since opening for them back in 76. They once headlined above X and the B-52s, released a single, and then faded into obscurity. We're the Rudys, and we're here for, for Johnny. We've known Dead Boys for a while. We played with them their first gig here many moons ago, Monday, Tuesday nights. The Senders were named Best Bar Band in New York by New York Press Magazine in 2001. Let's For Dead Records calls them the Great Lost Band of New York Punk, and Ugly Things Magazine calls them Max's Second Stringers, best known as Pals of Johnny Thunders, who was a member of the band for about a month. They appear to be keeping active and according to their website have five albums and over 2,000 gigs under their belts. Steel Tips were an art punk sextet from New Jersey who, according to Trouser Press, were quote, universally ignored and or abhorred during their existence. They were both nihilistic and confrontational, and they too liked to pick fights with their audience. Suicide came from the pre-CBGB Mercer Arts scene. The synth punk duo consisting of vocalist Alan Vega and Martin Rev were among the earliest bands to embrace the descriptor punk way back in 1970. Blondie was not advertised in papers, but made the Arturo Vega design t-shirt. They brought with them Robert Fripp, formerly of King Crimson. Blondie was yet to become an international household name and performed a short set of mostly covers, including the Ramones' Oh Oh I Love Her So, the Runaways' I Love Playing With Fire, Iggy Pop's Sister Midnight, and Donna Summer's I Feel Love. Front lady Debbie Harry later said it was a super gig, and someone afterwards said that our sound put them in a trance. What could be better? Closing out the night was Dead Boys with guest star Divine, whose play The Neon Woman had just opened less than a month before. Former Alice Cooper guitarist Glenn Buxton also joined the fun for an encore performance of 18. DJ Bob Rudnick shared MC duties with Cheetah Chrome. Derringer and Richard Hell are listed on the t-shirt, but I can't find any information about them, so if you know anything, let me know. 
Anya Phillips, described by Chris Stein as, quote, fashionista and influencer, performed a striptease. Debbie Harry remembers, quote, she was supposed to have a blackout and disappear when she was finished, but the lighting man was so entranced he forgot to turn the lights out, so she just ran off and got dressed in the kitchen. My producer, Sweet Jimmy, caught up with said lighting man, Cosmo Ohms, who said of the festival, there was an air of excitement and the energy surrounding the event was intense. Ohms also said the club was packed every night. This echoes Scott Kemper's statement claiming the dictators broke attendance records. Blondie drummer Clem Burke recalls announcing the benefit gig from the stage of their sold-out Palladium show the night before, making them a significant draw despite the lack of advertising. In addition, the Ramones at this point were a bit too big for the tiny venue. Cheetah Chrome remembers having to clean out the alley behind the bar in order to make room for the Ramones equipment truck. The festival drew record crowds and forced the bands to enter through the back door, a CBGB first. Johnny Blitz later told Third Wave magazine that he wasn't really surprised at the turnout. The Johnny Blitz benefit had raised a significant amount to help cover medical and legal bills that arose from the stabbing. Bomp magazine puts the receipts at around $8,000. Stiv Bader's told New Wave Rock magazine that the total was more like $6,000, and it wasn't nearly enough. Blitz's bail, he says, was $25,000. Sticker's bail was also $25K. The lawyer cost ten grand. In the same interview, Bader also expressed gratitude for Hilly Crystal, who, he says, put up the deed to the Anderson Theater for bail. But in December 1980, Cheetah Chrome told Damage Fanzine, quote, Hilly took the money from the Blitz Benefit concert. Blitz got stabbed and we tried to raise money for him, but Hilly spent it to pay his taxes. But wait! There's more! Remember Blondie Rody Michael Sticka, who was sitting in Rikers awaiting a murder trial? He was still there, and he still thought half of the proceeds would go to his legal bills, but according to Slyman, Sticka never saw a dime, and he was the guy who risked his life at the knife fight. Sticker says the prosecution's case fell apart when the woman who attacked Marsha Leone testified that she did not hear him shout any kind of racial remarks to the car full of Puerto Ricans, as it was cold that night and they had the windows closed. It cost me $8,000, he says, in a fucking year of bullshit. It wasn't until his release that he found out Blitz ultimately survived the attack. He felt abandoned by both the Blondie and Dead Boy camps. With the benefit weekend behind them, there was nothing to do except wait for Blitz to get better. Baders and Zero went back to Ohio and played a few gigs to raise additional funds. Chrome stayed in the city and further explored the drug scene. As Blitz recovered, plans were made for another tour. The label hired a new drum tech called Beef, who could substitute for Blitz when necessary. It seems Blitz's recovery was inconvenient for Sire Records, who had pressured the band to get back on the road and to get back in the studio as quickly as possible. The band's sophomore album was a disappointment all around, and Chrome blames the label's pressure and their choice of producer. The end of the band, as far as I was concerned, says Hilly Crystal, was after the second album, when Sire didn't renew the contract. They wanted maybe Stiv Baders and Jimmy Zero, but we could never come to anything, and the Dead Boys were a little upset about the whole thing. According to Chrome's memoir, the Dead Boys were on tour in Cincinnati when they were summoned to New York to meet with Sire Records president Seymour Stein and Hilly Crystal. There they were told that record sales were disappointing and they were pushed to change direction and change the name of the band. Chrome says he walked out of the meeting and that was that for the Dead Boys. And that's that for our look at the Johnny Blitz benefit of 1978. I know there are a few blanks in the story so feel free to comment below with any corrections, info, insights, or memories. This Month in Punk Rock History is written and performed by me, Brendan McCabe. My producer is Sweet Jimmy Cook. And this episode featured additional visuals by my friend Danny. And join me next month when the Contortions make another appearance supporting Crass in their only tour in the U.S. In the meantime, don't forget to check out my half-assed attempt to recount the day-by-day -day events of the scene with Today in Punk Rock History via tiprh.start.page. For this month in punk rock history, I'm Brendan McCabe. Are you curious about some of the bands mentioned in today's episode? Check out our Spotify playlist, Save Johnny Blitz. The link is in the description.